I uh, want to welcome you to this last panel. And I uh, want you to kindly join me. It has been said many times during the day, but uh, Michael and his cohort, especially Nancy Pratt and others, thank you very much, Michael, for a wonderful very rich and exciting day, lively day. Um, I know that uh, you're all patient, and patience is not inexhaustible. But still, you have been very patient, and I want to thank you for being here for this last panel. Um, the panel, Michael thought about it, and he suggested that uh, we have, instead of a panel, kind of conversation today. And the conversation is on an issue that is of a great deal of concern to all of us. The war on terror, the phrase, the terminology that was used, and uh, what kind of impact did it have all over the world, and what kind of impact did it have in the US? But our focus is going to be on international law. As you know, there is a debate as to what kind of great impact 9-11 had and the war on terror had, and uh, Financial Times and others have been doing all kind of uh, debate and writing on it. And this screaming headline from the Financial Times is, no, 9-11 did not change the world. And uh, the last uh, paragraph, simply two lines, I want to read them to you. It says, the sweep of history will record the past decade as a parenthesis, separating a brief period of unparalleled US might from a new and chaotic multipolar world. Al-Qaeda had to be defeated, but for all the horror he inflicted on 9-11, Bill Laden did not really change very much at all. Um, we might uh, debate the issue, uh, but the fact is that 9-11 in this country at least brought a great deal of fear initially, great deal of anger, for many a great deal of grief, and those wounds have not healed. And that um, emotions, those emotions are still raw. And today we are not going to talk about uh, India and China and Brazil all these countries rising or where the United States is in the world arena in the next few years, but uh, we'll be talking about the impact upon international law. Has it changed international law? And uh, the format is going to be conversational. Um, I have in consultation with my colleagues about uh, five, six questions. We may not have the time to do all of them, and I uh, won't uh, interject myself. But I will be asking questions, and if there is a little time at the end, then I am going to wear the other hat. And uh, to your questions or comments, I would like then to be a participant along with my distinguished colleagues. Uh, let me then begin with the first question. And the first question simply is going to be, that terrorism as we know it, international terrorism, it has had many incarnations. It's not, in fact, a new phenomenon. We have had terrorists fighting colonialism. We had terrorists fighting on ideological grounds. I don't need to remind you of the Red Brigade and all that happened in Germany, in Italy, in many other European countries. But what is new about this international terrorism? Is it new because of ethnic and religious dimension to it? Is it new because of its intensity? Is it new because it's all over the world? And if it is, how does it impact, how has it impacted international law? And I uh, need to mention to you where I'm going with all this and uh, then we can just move on and I'll be asking questions and any of my colleagues would answer them. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to control their timing, but I am going to request them at the outset that uh, Michael says we ought to complete this by five. 
And uh, so in order to do that, uh, I will be brief in my questions, and I'm going to request all of you to be pretty, pretty concise in your answers. So the question first would be, are there additional challenges that uh, international law faces because of this new face of international terrorism? And then from there, I'll simply move on that uh, we've had usually the criminal model. And today, when we talk about war on terror and the war model, how does that change everything? And here the question would be that uh, there is a change in the nature of war, is there? And then you'll all agree that uh, with all these terrorist non-state actors and coming with such great force and momentum that they have changed the landscape. And so if there is a change in the nature of war or armed conflict, are there new obstacles to combating terrorism effectively? I'd like to begin with that, and then I'm going to join my colleagues on one of those thrones. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody who can King start. Bed. Well, Bed, uh, God, Bed has kindly said I can start here, since I asked uh, the uh, question about the new terrorism. And uh, I've, uh, the paper I've uh, submitted uh, for uh, the uh, journal, uh, oh, thank you, has uh, basically the title, uh, International Law and the Challenges of uh, the New uh, Terrorism and the Changing Nature of War. So I'm not going to go into all of the details of uh, the paper because, if one, they would all go to sleep, and uh, two, uh, I'd get uh, the, the hook. Uh, let me just uh, mention, however, that I am very strongly of the view uh, that uh, there is a new form of terrorism uh, which has created uh, a uh, major challenge to efforts to uh, combat uh, terrorism. It's a much greater threat than the old terrorism was. Uh, and it is uh, coupled with the changing nature of war. Indeed, it has to somewhat, to some extent, uh, been a result of uh, the emergence of uh, the new terrorism. To begin with, uh, the 9-11, uh, as you know, about uh, almost 3,000 people were killed uh, by uh, the extraordinary events that took uh, place on uh, that day. They were motivated. They're motivated uh, by Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic uh, jihadism, uh, directed against the United States with the purpose of driving the United States out of uh, the Middle East, uh, and uh, with the purpose of, uh, at least in some time in the future, to establishing an Islamic uh, caliphate. Uh, the, uh, uh, the major fact right off the bat was that almost 3,000 people were killed because of the old terrorism, uh, which was basically nationally oriented. Uh, the, uh, I believe it's true that uh, the highest number of deaths were 80. And uh, so 3,000 is up there. Uh, and uh, so and the call from uh, Osama bin Laden to kill as many Americans as possible, of course, no distinction between civilians or uh, armed troops or so forth, was a major change, I would suggest. And of course, it relates to uh, the question of the war model versus the criminal law model and so forth. Uh, second, uh, I go back a long ways, quite frankly. You know, I'm an old goat. Uh, and uh, started uh, working in this particular vineyard in, in 1973. And uh, that was the old uh, uh, terrorism. And one of the things that we used to tell each other uh, during those days was uh, that uh, as far as possible technological terrorism or mass terrorism, uh, the uh, threat was not that great because uh, many of the terrorists were simply incompetent, which they were. They didn't have the technological skills. The diabolical cleverness of 9-11 uh, shows that we were dealing uh, with an entirely uh, different uh, breed of cat uh, when dealing uh, with uh, bin Laden uh, and, uh, and company. The second uh, aspect is that most of the uh, major change of the new terrorism is that it is truly global in nature. Uh, it is uh, read recently that it's uh, estimated that now we've got terrorists operating in uh, 100 different countries. Uh, and, 
And then it, it's important to note, I think, by the way, uh, that uh, while everyone talks about Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda is not the only uh, is fundamentalist Islamic terrorist organization. Uh, and uh, so this idea well, that uh, Al-Qaeda is or is not on its uh, last legs, my view is it isn't, uh, but it's not the only uh, worry uh, here. Uh, there is, of course, now the real concern. The problem, the, in fact, you could almost say the U.S. government is, uh, uh, becomes apoplectic when they think about this. The idea of uh, use of uh, weapons of mass destruction by, uh, the, uh, by the new uh, uh, terrorists. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the nature of uh, the, uh, the conflict, of course, here we are, we had the wars in Iraq, we had the war, we have still a war in Afghanistan, for that matter, it's not even clear it's over in Iraq. Uh, we're uh, sending drones and special ops into uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, apparently is, uh, to the Supreme Court of the United States says it's a non-international armed conflict, which is interesting, uh, but uh, the uh, a debatable uh, point. Uh, but it is, it requires, of course, a massive uh, international. I'll make one more, one more comment here, because I'm going to stop, because I can't go, and the bed uh, pull me back, which is good. I just, uh, I just uh, want to note uh, something that became very clear to me, some of you may know about. Washington Post uh, did uh, a variety of articles, and there's a book now by a Dana Priest, which indicates, it talks in great detail about the internal security apparatus that's been set up. That's the impact of the new terrorism. Uh, an incredibly expensive, incredibly intrusive, uh, and according uh, to uh, Dana Priest, who I heard uh, interviewed partially on uh, National Public Radio, uh, incredibly ineffective. Thank you. Um, two of these uh, colleagues, you have uh, seen them, heard about them, and you have uh, information about all of my colleagues in your papers. But uh, the one talking right now is Professor John Murphy from Villanova. He has uh, worked with uh, the Department of State Legal Advisor's Office. He has been a practicing lawyer. He has uh, been in India and other places uh, giving sermons on international law. <laughs> and uh, uh, next, the one who is keen now to talk, but he can't talk so long as I am, uh, <laughs> he is Professor Julian Koo presently at Hofstra, just came back from China, and he has been, as all these four people are, um, not simply an advocate, but a champion of human rights and international law, and also working in the public area. He talks about the constitutional law, works on international law, both domestic and international areas, and that intersection is the one that uh, we really are worried about, concerned about today, and here is Julian. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to, to uh, spend the day listening to all the great panels and also to participate. Thank you, Professor. Um, and uh, just a quick thought on some of these issues, which I've been, um, it's, it, it's mind boggling that it's been 10 years now um, since 9 11. And I think it has, to me, changed the landscape uh, on, on some levels, but hasn't in some. So one area where I think it hasn't, at least international law has not really changed, or it's surprising it hasn't changed more, is that there still does not seem to be an international law consensus on the definition of terrorism. This continues to be a thorny, hotly debated, continually sort of battled over topic, and so that so-called international treaties, conventions, or other typical mechanisms to, that you would typically expect to define uh, terrorism and then maybe define sort of punishments for terrorism uh, and would also perhaps guide policy responses to terrorism haven't really arisen since, uh, they, w they didn't arise before 9-11, but they also weren't spurred by 9-11, <laughs> um, nor did they account for new types of terrorism uh, that I think I agree with uh, John Murphy that this, uh, so I'm, I'm struck by, on that level I think international law has um, not changed, but that's too bad because I think it, there was an opportunity there and there still is an opportunity for some sort of international consensus. I would say this, though. What, to me, the biggest change, uh, uh, I agree that, that there's, 
9-11 launched a new era of uh, a new type of threat for terrorism. And the response of the United States and other countries, but particularly the United States, was also new <laughs> and different. And to me, the most central concept, which sometimes isn't always talked about, but I think uh, Ved mentioned it, uh, what we call the criminal law model versus the war model. I would go farther and actually say it's an important legal basis that the United States has since September 18th, 2011, uh, 2001, has declared war or at least authorized the use of military force and has been engaged and believes it is engaged in an armed conflict for the purposes of international law with a non-state actor. Um, this is the basis, the legal justification for almost every action the United States has taken in the war on terrorism including, uh, most recently, the use of targeted killings for without which there could not be legal justification under international law, um, the detention in Guantanamo Bay or otherwise, detention in Afghanistan, um, and military commission trials. And I'm struck by, and this, uh, this is something which was controversial to some degree when it was first launched in 2001. Interestingly, I think one thing that has changed, at least within the United States, is there does seem to be some acceptance of this idea that you can be engaged in an armed conflict, whether it's non-international or not, um, with a non-state actor. And that the United States can therefore engage in a global war, can, it, it can use drones all over the world to kill an, uh, even American citizens um, through, through the use of military force. And so that, I think, is uh, the biggest change. I mean, and, uh, it's understandable and perhaps expected, but it is, I think, to me, the, the biggest change, conceptual change in international law uh, since 9-11. Since I want to uh, agree with one thing Julian has said and disagree with another. Um, starting with the disagreement, he said that we're still, uh, there's really no consensus on a definition of terrorism. There was a really interesting development on February 16th when the appeals chamber of the Special Court for Sierra Leone issued an opinion uh, penned by Judge Cassese, who used to be the president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, in which for 300 pages he describes that in fact there is now a a customary international law definition of terrorism. Now, it is not clear to me that everybody will immediately agree with him about this, but given that it's being propagated by such a senior judge who's written distinguished things and gotten away with creating new international law before at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, we noticed. like joint criminal enterprise liability and, and other things, um, I think there's a chance that, that this definition is going to change the entire dialogue about whether there is a consensus definition of terrorism or not. So that's one development. Um, the other thing is I, I've done in my writings, uh, I've been talking about something called the Groschen moment, which is the concept that customary international law can at times be formed quite rapidly. There can be acceleration of the formation process. And it happens when there are paradigm shifts or times of fundamental change. And ultimately, I agree with Julian that 9-11 was seen by the world community as a fundamental change. And although the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has sort of fought a rear guard uh, battle against this in its opinions on the wall and in the Congo case, in fact, all the countries in the world seem to have bought into the idea that you can attack a non-state actor in another state when that state is not doing anything to prevent the threat that is being held against you. And that's new law. And, and I think that we're, we're still in a period where people are trying to figure out whether there's an international consensus about that. I think we're very close to that. Uh, just a few, few comments. W one just on, on the issue of whether it's all new or not. I mean, clearly the UN had a very long history through the 70s and 80s and 90s of these technique-specific uh, prohibitions on terrorist acts of airplane bombing, hijackings attacking diplomats, uh, the bombing convention itself. It could never agree on a comprehensive definition of terrorism, but now the Indians have finally acknowledged that this should go forward. So uh, even though I always admire you know's creativity, even if it's ipsy-dixit, ipsy uh, I, I think there, there'll, there'll be a more traditional track for, for, for setting out the uh, definition. For me, the big difference after 9-11, uh, which is how my troubles began, as they say in the comic book, <laughs> was only that uh, we had thought of terrorism always as being to be addressed in retrospect, the isolated little crazy Omega-7 guy who might try to send a bazooka from Queens against the United Nations. You could catch them with the FBI and they were one-off events and you could largely hope to have forensically sufficient proof for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And what was different about 9-11 was the fear that since prosecutors, of which I used to be one, uh, are largely retrospective in their view. Uh, they are proving a case from the past, they're historical. 
that they weren't really tasked or equipped to be the major preventative mechanism, and that the FEBs and the CIA, the FBI and the CIA, were uh, uh, working onshore, offshore, uh, and couldn't integrate their information with the prosecutorial folks who had a treasure trove of stuff in Al-Qaeda. So I think in many ways, if you want a constitutional shift, it's the thought that you really had to have an all-spectrum, all-geographic ability to follow groups that themselves don't particularly respect borders. I think the, uh, in a way for my, my purposes, what's most interesting in addressing the legal framework to counterterrorism is good old additional protocol number one, which we, uh, Geneva Protocol one, which we may or may not ever fully ratify. But what that makes clear, uh, it's in part what the Reagan folks didn't like, but it covers wars of national liberation. So even if at its most flattering, you were somehow to credit Al-Qaeda with a war of national liberation of the Ummah or whatever, uh, it, the, 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 the demand of additional protocol one, which has largely passed into customary law, is that those wars too must be fought according to the ordinary norms of armed conflict, which privilege civilians, spare civilians, and limit attacks to uh, military targets. But two things, uh, one about the uh, definition uh, at the United Nations, all these years, uh, there has been an effort, Indians, others have brought in, and uh, there has been no consensus. So Michael, if in the United Nations General Assembly, in all those decisions, the countries are not willing to accept that definition. There is no consensus. At that point, to argue that it has become customary international law, I think would be a little immature, although I agree with you that uh, there are 13 treaties, 13 conventions. All of them have some elements of uh, terrorism, and uh, with a great deal of uh, um, being specific and definite. And then I think you can probably argue that then there is no need for a comprehensive treaty that we do have uh, in a piecemeal kind of fashion met all the needs that normally you would say that a norm of international law ought to have. And finally, I want to say that um, when you talk about a uh, war model, um, then I think the tricky issue comes how long are you going to detain those Al-Qaeda? In war model, you usually had that as the war ends, you free those suspects, and you free at least those people who have been held under that war model as uh, detainees. And in this detention, when does the war end with Al-Qaeda, and when do we have those people detained in Guantanamo Bay um, freed? Well, let me address uh, your question about the General Assembly resolutions. Interestingly, in 1993, I was attorney advisor for United Nations Affairs, and I gave a speech which is reproduced in uh, the International Criminal Law and International Organizations casebook that I have. Um, in which I took and the case position. And uh, outside will be <laughs> farther. <laughs> but I took the position that, that you just articulated. I said, look, the international community is never going to agree on one universal definition of terrorism. One person's freedom fighter is another's <clears throat> terrorists. Instead, we have these 13 treaties, and let's just agree that those are terrorists and nobody can use those. And in fact, with the General Assembly resolutions that started being promulgated that year and have been repromulgated, and the Security Council resolutions say, is that they list in the pre the 13 anti-terrorism conventions, and then they have the first operative clause saying, resolved that all terrorism is unjustifiable and illegitimate and, can, and it's criminal, full stop. However, the next sentence says that it's a savings clause that says that nothing in this resolution means that people cannot struggle legitimately for self-determination. And what those two sentences together with the preamble meant was that you could never use hostage taking or attacks against airplanes or the things that are covered, hijacking and so forth, in those treaties as a legitimate way of struggling for self-determination. But there's a lot that's not covered in those treaties, and that was still open field for self-determination movements. Now, what happened, though, is toward the end of this process, the um, United Nations negotiated the Anti-Terrorism Financing Convention. And that 
did contain a general definition that came very close to having everybody agree. Now, not all the countries in the world immediately ratified that. So then after 9-11, there was a Security Council resolution that was passed that essentially reproduced that definition and said that countries can't finance terrorists. And so I think what was happening before Cassese's opinion is that, in fact, there was a lot of movement in this direction. I agree with all of you that it's not going to just happen from one judicial opinion out of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Um, it's going to have to happen in committees at the UN, maybe in a convention. But I do think that it's changed the playing field. The, the argument is going to be different now. That That's uh, evolving and emerging kind of norm. But uh, what about um, detaining those people? Are they going to be in indefinite detention? Um, well, I think that this, this raises the interesting point, which is that, so if everyone agrees we're in a war, and by the way, I mean, other, we might all seem to agree on this. I'm not sure that everyone actually does agree. But, um, but you know, Julian, yeah, yeah. the Obama administration has practically retired that phrase. They have never used the phrase war on terror. Right, but they are, as a legal matter, committed to the concept that they are engaged in an armed conflict. I, um, there's no way they could do the things they do. and. I know that they could, well, they might be able to live with themselves, but they, they can't do what they're doing uh, by uh, any of the things they're doing, even the, things they, that, the th new things they're doing that they came up with and the old stuff they're following from the Bush administration. They, on, that, on that front, I think they're pretty much in the same. I mean, I think it's a question of what kind of armed conflict, and everyone now is battling over that. Although, I just, I, I run this blog called Opinion Jurist, so I, I get to communicate with the internet world, and every once in a while I get a comment, like, there's no, you know, you can't have a war, you know, that's, Human rights law should apply just like in every other circumstance. And so everything the United States has done pretty much is illegal. Um, but I agree that a lot of people, are, the consensus in the United States government is that it is an armed conflict. And so the, it, the question really is what kind of armed conflict and what does it permit, the United, what constraints does it impose in the US government? That's really the difference, I think, between the early Bush administration and the current Obama administration. One issue might be, for instance, detention. Like, uh, d now, in traditional armed conflict, you, the end of the armed conflict, then you release. I think that that conception, I think, would still fit here. I think people who say there could never be an end to the war are not, I think that's a bit of an overstatement. There could be an end to the war. In fact, as a legal matter, for US law purposes, I think it's arguable that President Obama could just declare, <laughs> we're done, right? It's, it's over. Or, uh, or Congress could. Congress. That we have won and come, we come home? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure he, I'm not sure he, maybe he'll wait till like November 2012 to declare victory, but, um, but, I, but I think that it, it's, it's, or Congress could, you know, enact a statute, you know, amending the authorization for the use of military force or ending, terminating its authority. I mean, there are legal mechanisms to end the war, and then you would, and so there's a process, a legal and a political process by which the war could end. I think the answer is no one actually wants, at least in the US government, wants to end the war because they don't think it's won. Um, and so it's a very long conflict. And, and, but I think that if you're concerned about this, so there is some comfort, and I think the Obama administration would argue that there's some comfort in the fact that we're constrained by, we have rules now governing how we treat the detainees. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, and what, we could try them perhaps under military rules or something, so. Let me uh, intervene here a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, as uh, you'll f find uh, if you read uh, my uh, paper, I have long been uh, a supporter of the idea of Richard Baxter, who was a, an outstanding international lawyer and a judge on the uh, World Court where he uh, decried the whole development of any attempts to try to have a legal concept of uh, terrorism. And I still hold that view. In my view, uh, the uh, efforts to uh, come up with a comprehensive definition, indeed a comprehensive uh, treaty on terrorism, uh, is uh, to use uh, the uh, old State Department cliche language, counterproductive. Uh, we need to uh, put our focus uh, elsewhere. Now, the other thing I, another thing I want to mention here uh, is that we've talked, uh, and Julian has talked about uh, the uh, law of armed conflict, and then, of course, there's international human rights. Uh, and uh, there is uh, also the possibility of uh, the whole concept of self-defense and uh, against, uh, a, uh, against armed attack. Uh, which takes place not in an armed conflict. This is something uh, uh, Kenneth Anderson, who was originally supposed to be uh, part of our group here, 
has uh, written about this, uh, and I think he's uh, made some useful uh, co comments in this respect. The idea that uh, Article 51, the self-defense of uh, the Charter, uh, may be a uh, basis in itself to uh, take out, to use drones uh, attacking uh, uh, the uh, bases of Al-Qaeda and uh, Taliban uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan. And uh, his reasoning is uh, that while now the war with, uh, or armed conflict, let's get away from war, armed conflict uh, with uh, Al-Qaeda has an intensity that uh, clearly rises to the definition of armed conflict. In the future, that uh, may not uh, be present. In that case, however, if you've got someone there uh, who is in a t another territory who is going uh, to uh, launch a major attack against you, uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is that any responsible president, such as Obama, is going uh, to uh, take uh, self, uh, active self-defense against that. The idea that the International Court of Justice said that there is no right of self-defense against a non-state actor uh, is just pure nonsense. That, that yeah. paragraph was actually drafted by someone in the registrar's office. Yeah, <laughs> I well, can tell I, you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it... Uh, no sensible statesman is going to pay any attention to... Uh, and so it concept. applies to Yemen? It, apl it definitely applies to Yemen. Yemen is uh, a uh, focal point. Uh, in fact, it's now Yemen and uh, they're sending drones into uh, Yemen and into Somalia uh, because uh, these are bases uh, for al-Qaeda. They've got this American uh, citizen uh, in, uh, in uh, Yemen who's uh, inciting... Uh, tax on America, and uh, he's on a hit list of, uh, for uh, the drones. And indeed, there was an effort in the U.S. court case to uh, try to uh, block this, and not surprisingly, because of the political offense exception idea, it, uh, it wasn't successful. Great. Oh, which one to comment on? Um, well, I guess one, one uh, while you're commenting on, I might say, you might also talk about the uh, protocols because uh, the Obama administration did say that they would like to have Protocol 2 part of it be ratified. Okay. And at that point... No, nobody ever had up. any problem with Protocol 2. It was Protocal 1. Yeah, yeah where they're saying, I know. Actually, one, one, little, one project on my to-do list, which I never get done, is there was an interest in the Clinton administration in seeing one could craft a package of reservations. Right. Taking all the hard-headed folks we're all friends with, Guy, Guy, Guy Roberts and you know, Hayes Parks and, and trying to put together a package which might make Protocol 1 acceptable because we already acknowledge that Protocol 1 is largely customary law. We have what are more or less tactical objections other than the issue of uniforms, but now we're fighting out of uniforms, so we may be more tolerant of fighting out of uniform. Um, I, I guess on, 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 on drones, I mean, the worry is since I did, I, after the Kosovo War, for my moral self-mortification, I went on a tour of Belgrade with my translator, lady of a certain age. This was after a Serbian judges training thing. I think you were there, weren't you, Michael? And she took me to see the Chinese embassy, which was this sort of gorgeous, white, Philip Johnson, asymmetric building, which looked, couldn't possibly be mistaken optically for a Serbian warehouse. <laughs> so I was never the least bit surprised that the Chinese were absolutely persuaded that we'd done it on purpose, except that a friend of mine cleared the target. <laughs> and he, he told me that it was indeed a mistake. Uh, I know, but, uh, but, it, but it shows that even with very smart people who are friends of mine, so to say, uh, uh, and they teach at law schools in Washington, uh, mistakes can happen. So you, you do worry about the practice of targeted killings, since killing is final, becoming too, too easy, too convenient, and subject to uh, insufficient, de at a minimum, checks and balances of, of both the sufficiency of the evidence and uh, the pro probabilistic persuasiveness of the evidence. Um, I, I, I think I, for, if you're defining this as an error, I mean, Terrorism is as old as the hills. It's what, the, 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 the Conrad novel of wanting to blow up the Greenwich t clock tower to strike at pure mathematics. Um, so doing things that are shocking to people is very, very old. What, had, what was different for me, I guess, in after 9-11, because I had really retired from this stuff. I didn't teach criminal law, really, at Yale. Um, 
was just that I had done a piece on bin Laden in 98 against my good left liberal friend Jules Lobel, the debate, and I had been reading around FIBIS at the time, Federal Broadcast Information Service, and began to pick up, and when you read around in, in foreign newspapers, you quickly become aware that intel stuff kind of leaks into those newspapers in a soft, deniable way. And there were lots of reports of what bin Laden was scratching around to look for. And after the attack occurred, on my first day teaching at Hopkins, uh, I was flying down on September 11th, I was genuinely frightened, and I'm not terribly alarmist as to what capacity he might have. And I went to talk to folks at Princeton, I went to talk to uh, Susan Eisenhower, who was married to Raoul Sadiev, did people think there were suitcase bombs? What did Dick Garwin think? Nobody knew. So there really was a genuine period of, I think, reasonably grounded fear of a truly catastrophic event despite which I'm going to the Nationals game on Sunday <laughs> on the anniversary. But, 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 I, but I do think that well, there is a kind of a grudging acceptance now in the Obama administration of not having any particularly better mechanism for dealing with this, that over time it will grate upon us. If you're going to hold some kid who was fighting in Afghanistan and now he's 62 years old looking gray around the gills, that there's got to be some way of reassessing people. There's got to be a dynamic account of the Brady obligation of trying to gather and evaluate exculpatory information. It's not sufficient, clearly, just to have a one-time catch with no possibility of release. We have uh, too many questions that uh, can be raised, but I'm going to conclude this by 4.45 so that uh, you have the opportunity to make some comments or raise some questions briefly. But uh, we've been talking about the administration, and I uh, want to raise two questions. Uh, one about the administration just gone by and one about the present administration. And I want to begin with you, Michael, because you uh, very eloquently said in your book, Shaping Foreign Policy in Times of Crisis. And you documented very clearly that the 10 living legal advisors of the Department of State all of them felt very strongly that uh, international law ought to be obeyed. International law is a living kind of uh, norm for us, and uh, we ought not to violate it. And uh, you asked a question, and I think I want you to answer it. How come that despite all that, in the Bush administration, we have those torture memos? Well. Paul Williams and I um, got all the legal advisors that are still alive together at Carnegie and had a really extraordinary uh, session with them where we asked them several questions about whether they believed international law was real law, did they ever convince a policymaker to forego policy preferences in order to comply with international law, and how do these kinds of situations like the White House torture memos, um, Abu Ghraib, uh, the mining of the harbors of Nicaragua, um, how, oh, and the uh, uh, abduction of Alvarez Machine. How do these happen if they basically all agreed that these were in violation of international law? And what we learned is that in 95% of these kinds of cases, the policymakers do defer to the lawyers. And what happens is there's not just one lawyer, the State Department lawyer, there's lawyers in various uh, agencies, and there's turf fighting, and there's maneuvering. And what happened in the case of the White House torture memos is that uh, what I would call a cabal of lawyers purposely kept the State Department legal advisor out. And members of that group, uh, John Yu, have written very cavalierly that they did it because they knew that the State Department legal advisor was going to take the opposite position and that it might make it harder for them to convince the policymakers to do what they wanted, and they were afraid that the State Department legal advisor might leak the information, and which would also make it harder for them to win. And so what they did is um, through a variety of mechanisms, including classifying things to the, the highest possible level and arguing that the State Department legal advisor did not have a need to know, even though these did affect our international law, they were able to keep them out of the loop. And this has happened, according to the legal advisors, four times in 30 years. And it is the exception, not the norm. 
And it's something that we should think about in terms of structural changes. In the United Kingdom, they actually have a rule that they have legislated that says that before something can go up to the prime minister um, that affects foreign policy, the legal advisor has to have commented on it. Now, they don't have to follow that advice, but they have to have commented on it. And we don't have that rule. Um, and it's, it's probably something that, that should come. You should see a wonderful op-ed written on June 28th, 2004, called Law and Torture by Woolsey and Wedgwood, saying that there should be a, a Grand Nichols idea. Uh, just the Joint Chiefs have to present to the President all the views of all the services even though it's just the chairman that'll meet with him. And so too, that at least at a minimum, a, a, the, the POTUS should be made aware of the disparate views of his various hatted legal advisors. Uh, just to, to add to that, I mean, I'm not gonna dispute anything Michael says about the legal advisor's office. I, I would be cautious about characterizing the legal advisor's office as being always the, I don't know, the, I don't know how to call them, the good, the good guys or the, or, <laughs> uh, or, or even perhaps the most authoritative interpreters of international law. Like just, just the story's coming out with respect to Libya. I don't want to bring up Libya too much, but the, the exact same turf battle arose over the definition of hostilities under the War Powers Act. Um, and as some of you know, the, the Obama administration has declared that it is not engaged in hostilities in Libya. Um, even, and so that, therefore it did not have to comply uh, with the War Powers Act because it's not engaged in hostilities. But the, the point is that, and you can sort of argue back and forth, the, 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 there's a huge division within the government. The Defense Department, which was engaged in the battle, the council there and the Department of Justice argued that they believe they were engaged in hostilities, if you can believe the reporting. <laughs> Uh, which is probably true. And then it was the State Department with the White House counsel who somehow managed to convince the president otherwise. And there's actually been some sharp criticism of the process because uh, the process was not done in the normal way, at least according to what people say. And uh, it allowed, it, so there's some concern that President Obama was allowed, essentially he was able to pick the legal opinion he wanted, <laughs> which is already going to support the policy. And it, and to be honest, the definition of hostilities under the War Powers Act, which is not precisely an international law issue, but it is related to some degree to international law, it was a difficult one to swallow, if, uh, even though it was written by um, Ruth's former colleague and my former professor, Harold Coe, not written but developed by, which is that you know, the United States, even though the commander of NATO forces is an American officer and drone it, drones are being used to kill Libyans, it was not engaged in hostilities. Um, this definition was controversial enough that other parts of government. So in other words, you can imagine that different departments could go different ways. I'm not sure what the best procedure is. Um, on the other hand, you might say, well, look, President Obama ultimately had all, everything presented to him. He made his call. Uh, the memoirs from Bush and Cheney, I believe, both suggest that they, at least, they, they also saw, at least they were aware of the different views on this, and they made their call as much as people might criticize them. I think people will probably, crit or they should criticize Obama on, maybe in a different way. I think he picked the, I'm, I'm inclined to think he picked the legal view that worked for him best. Well, 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 one, one I, uh, Harold made this presentation at Naval War College also, essentially arguing you don't want it to be hostilities because if it was hostilities you couldn't go forward and what about Rwanda? Yeah. Yeah. And I would have been much more comfortable with a savings clause argument that ultimately if you have a sufficiently robust account of executive power in the, you know, in the conundrum, uh, then you wouldn't have to be parsing hostilities quite so narrowly as a statutory matter. Um, but I, but, my, but my, uh, my operational concern was it may, it, I, I just wonder, because I'm not, I know nothing about nothing anymore, but it, I, I wonder whether the way we fought the war, sort of lingering on the outskirts instead of trying to help it come to a, a quicker con conclusion, which could, might, might have saved lives. Leading from the back? It, 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 with leading from behind or... Okay is whether that was in fact influenced by the inf unspoken diffidence of the administration on their legal justification for going forward. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, on uh, this uh, turf war, this of course is a long-standing uh, phenomenon. Uh, I think with it regard to the torture memos, uh, the thing that really stands out uh, is uh, that there was a definite, not only uh, an effort to keep the State Department out of it, but also the Defense Department out of it, and put it in the hands of people in the Justice Department uh, who would do the right thing. And that, it seems to me, is, uh, was a, uh, 
uh, an act that was uh, entirely out of order. Uh, the, uh, but uh, it, it, you will have uh, battles over uh, the Justice Department and uh, way back in before the flood when I was in the legal advisor's office in the 60s, even then, uh, they had the Justice Department getting involved in their arguments and so forth and so on. So that's, uh, uh, you know, fairly, uh, a fairly standard uh, kind can, of can, problem. Can, can, can I just tell, tell one story on myself? <laughs> Lest I die in an auto accident on the way out the door. <laughs> it should be out. <laughs> when, 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 when the uh, when, when the memos came out, I think I, s I don't remember when I saw them. Maybe they'd been leaked on the web or something. But um, I I happened to know at that point. I had a lot of odd friends and wonderful friends. But I knew Newt, Newt Gingrich a bit, so I wrote this very passionate memo to Newt Gingrich saying, "What the." <laughs> a long version and a short version. <laughs> and then I got back an email saying, do you mind if I send this to the vice president's office? <laughs> and I didn't know from the vice president's office, <laughs> although my life did pass before me. <laughs> and of course you have to say yes. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I can't, go, I can't go back to the Democrats, I can't go to the rogue, I am alone. <laughs> but as it turned out, I guess my, my feeling at the time was that what, what happened happened, not justifying it but that it was enormously important this not become enshrined doctrine. And therefore, what Will, Hap, what Will Taft helped engineer, Jack Goldsmith, was to, for the first time in recently recorded history, uh, have the memo be rescinded, yeah. which was important. Otherwise, it became canonical. Uh, I think uh, we'll just uh, have one more question here, and then we can move to you. And uh, since we have been talking about administrations, um, you probably recall that the Obama administration came uh, and pledged, promised that uh, they are going to change the counter-terrorism policies of the Bush administration. Uh, now that a uh, few years have passed and we can look at their track record, uh, what is the track record? Did they do that? Uh, were those policies, were those tactics um, uh, rescinded, uh, were changes made that are fundamental and uh, significant? And uh, Michael, why don't you begin that? This really pains me <laughs> because I think that for the most part you see a, a, a continuity of policy. Now I should say that between Bush 1 and Bush 2 there was a radical change, I thought. Um, a, a lot had, had changed. And what I see is Obama continuing what was going on in the second Bush administration. But he's ex in some ways, he's expanded the drone attacks, which we talked about, that, that make me very nervous for the reasons that Ruth said, that you can't undo that if there's a mistake. And there are mistakes. Um, and he seems, in, in particular, to like drones over apprehending people, because where do you put them? In Guantanamo Bay, he doesn't want to do that. Uh, he, he has no choices on Guantanamo Bay because Congress has cut him off. So he's tried to reconfigure the military commissions. Um, the military commission started off being extraordinarily bad. They were improved in the second Bush administration, and they've been further improved to the extent that we now have a graduate of Case Western, uh, Mike Leibowitz, who is one of the prosecutors. And he um, has approached us about doing research work for him like we do the international tribunals. So we set up a lab. And I, I guess we're comfortable enough to do work now for the military commissions, which I wouldn't have said eight years ago. Um, but for the most you part, know, age, yeah. people change. Yeah, maybe that's it. <laughs> I, I would say that fighting, you know, fighting terrorism, whether it's a war or not, uh, is difficult. And when you're in power, all that legal stuff gets in your way. <laughs> And, and it, they see there's much more nuance than, than it is when you're on the campaign trail or when you're an academic, perhaps. And they have to deal with real-world situations and really tough calls. And, and so what you're seeing is that when you know, the rubber hits the road, uh, he's, I think, siding on national security over the niceties of law, which makes a lot of liberal folks and academics uh, pain. And that's why I started that way. And I uh, am not going to debate John but on self-defense, and uh, since he has written a lot, and I too have done some, I could argue differently. Oh yes, there's always, there's always an argument, particularly on self-defense, uh, which has been argued ad nauseum for uh, eons. Uh, the, uh, I think there has been a change uh, between the two administrations. 
And uh, as far as I know, uh, there are no longer, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there are any uh, extraordinary renditions anymore. There are renditions done are there, still, are, yes. And still yes. without uh, the... Uh, well, extraordinary the renditions. I didn't want to bring that issue, but now that you have... Okay, well, that case, it, I, uh, I stand corrected. I'm somewhat appalled uh, to uh, learn it. Yeah. How about uh, these... Uh, uh, special cells uh, in Europe at the CIA. I think they have, have stopped them. Yeah. But Bagram Air Force Base has been expanded. Yeah, so yeah. That has been, yeah. But at the well, same well, time... Well, one worry one has is that uh, the, if, if, if so much em emphasis is simply putting on avoiding U.S. fingerprints, then you can have worse outcomes for people. And you can have people consigned to pardon my French, shitholes in, in, in Iraq or in, uh, or in Afghanistan where because we're not in any way involved, where we feel out of sight, out of mind. But morally consigning people to that is not a happy solution. So it's, uh, I, I worry at times that the, the, the political fallout of moral embarrassment of being involved in something may in fact, in a sort of utilitarian way, lead to a worse outcome for more people. Earlier uh, in our discussion, a couple of times the issue came that uh, the United States uh, is not going to hand over anyone where to a regime that uh, possibly is going to torture or possibly is going to violate human rights. And the uh, extraordinary renditions, well, what are they? They are simply having a person abducted, put on a jet, sent to a country where we know that he is going to be tortured, and simply based upon diplomatic nicety to tell that country, please treat him humanely when we know he's not going to be treated humanely. And that is the basis on which we say that human rights are not going to be violated. Um, I think uh, we probably, um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to make one final comment on anything. There are other questions, but I'm not going to raise them. Let's, uh, let's open it up. And, uh, um, Paul, why don't you come, at least uh, talk? You have been working in this area so long, and you have done so much. <laughs> All right. Michael had said earlier, don't be shy. Please come. And um, any comment, any question, but short. Uh, hi, my name is Kevin. I'm a student here at Case, and I was just wondering, um, you guys briefly mentioned the fact that uh, with the issues of war on terror, there's been a change where the U.S. now considers itself constantly at war. But in that effect, hasn't it strengthened international law because it's gotten to the point where now international law is always applying to the United States military and always in situations that they're uh, and we're constantly pushing it, like you're talking about with Guantanamo Bay, and we're constantly having to, I, I guess, sort of strengthen the international restrictions on the United States because we're doing that. So is it, in effect, strengthening uh, international law? So part of the answer is that there's two kinds of international law that are potentially applicable, as we referred. International human rights law, which is uh, codified in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which has a very high standard for protection of civilians. And international humanitarian law, the law of war, which has a lower standard for protection of civilians. And what we see is that human rights law now is not being applied for the most part. Um, so to answer part of your question is no, it's, it's on the human rights front, it's weakening. But as far as you, international humanitarian law, now then it gets even more complicated, as my colleagues will tell you. Is it um, an international armed conflict or an internal arm, armed conflict? Which provisions of the Geneva Conventions are applicable? Some have very strong and high thresholds. Some have lower thresholds. And my sense is that they are choosing to go with the lower thresholds. <laughs> and so even in that sense, um, although the Geneva Conventions are then seen as always applicable, it's not the highest level of law that's being applied. Just because it's a matter of honor, I have to disagree. Um, I, I mean, clearly you have these two different paradigms of human rights law, law of armed conflict. They grew up with different communities, ICRC versus the, the Pally Wilson folks. Uh, but they, they, it, it's probably a mistake to say one trumps the other. They should be read in light of each other. Uh, otherwise, you get extreme 
uh, results on both sides. All right, let me uh, comment on this because it relates to the second part of my uh, paper, actually, and that is the uh, challenges posed by asymmetrical warfare. Uh, the problem uh, is the Al-Qaeda, of course, engages in asymmetrical warfare. Uh, and the question then is, uh, what, uh, what law is going to apply? Just, just under assuming the law of armed conflict applies, what law of armed conflict applies? Uh, and I think it's worth noting in this respect uh, that uh, the Yugoslav tribunal uh, in uh, the Celebisi case has c claimed uh, that uh, the, we have now a situation where customary international law has evolved to the point uh, where uh, the uh, Geneva Convention's provisions, most of them apply to non-international law armed conflict. And so if, and uh, of course one of the big problems with non-international armed conflict is that it's hard to find a law on it because states don't like to uh, be uh, uh, constrained by international law. They want to handle uh, rebels and their problems uh, internal uh, under their own law, mainly uh, with as few constraints uh, as, uh, as possible. So you've got um, the situation, and there's a, a major treatise that's been published uh, recently by a name, uh, by the name of Gary Solis, in fact, that won a certificate of merit from uh, the uh, American Society of International Law, and he states categorically now, sort of citing the Yugoslav Tribunal and other sources, uh, that uh, the, uh, basically there's been a merger or convergence of uh, the law of international armed conflict represented by the Geneva Conventions and Protocol 1 and uh, non-international uh, law situations. Now, that may or may not be true, but uh, the uh, part of the problem here is, I think, there really is sort of a groping for law and groping for how to deal with this situation. Asymmetrical warfare is very difficult to deal with uh, because you take the situation where you've got al-Qaeda uh, and uh, Taliban going out of Pakistan and strong evidence that Taliban is not only not taking effort to stop it but c conspiring with them and helping them out, uh, then uh, you're going to invade Pakistan? Well, that's, that's why the drones are used. I mean, the drones are being uh, used uh, and they're very controversial and there are all sorts of debates and so forth. A lot of this has come out already. But the drones are being used, I would suggest, because what's the option? You're going to, we have some special ops groups that go in there, and yet that creates more problems even than the drones. Uh, so, uh, and uh, then there's just a final point on this. There is, of course, something called what I would call the propaganda war here. Uh, and uh, the drones uh, involve, uh, necessarily, area warfare necessarily involves civilian casualties. And the, the reality is, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the claim is you can't have any civilian casualties. Well, if you can't use drones, you can't use uh, uh, air, air warfare, uh, the advantages in this battle are to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And the question is, uh, are we going to be, are our armed forces going to be able to prevail in Taliban? The, Historical evidence is, if there is a safe haven state, you lose. Unless you can deal with that and eliminate it, you lose. Thank you. I just, uh, I don't even know if it's a question, but it's just a couple things that kept coming to my mind when I keep looking at war on terror. And it seems like terrorism has always existed. But it seemed like in the past we needed a justification for fighting terror. And I think initially after 9-11 there was the issue of weapons of mass destruction and then we heard that maybe they did exist, maybe they didn't exist. So it's like now that we don't even really need a justification anymore. And then I started thinking about, you know, Bin Laden and how we went in and he was captured and that. So can you all speak a little bit about, you know, justifications to entering into the war on terror and how you act in terms of it's different now. So it's not a country. You have these, these groups that are initiating this. And so how do you use law to combat that? Thank you. I mean, um, I'm just going to say that uh, this will be probably a question on which I'm going to ask my colleagues to this question or anything else that has transpired, whatever they would like to say 
Um, let's begin with Michael and take about a minute each, and I will conclude with that. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I see that you sense that everybody is getting exhausted and it's time to round up. Um, and that's a, a good way to end. I guess, Max, that, that means you won't oh. get a chance to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Not to uh, disappoint you. Excuse me. Did you want? Yeah, uh, just you'll to let say that. Yeah, let him just uh, ask. Why don't well. you throw in your question, too, yeah, and great, then we'll great. respond to that. Um, I wanted to address the Cassese decision from February 16th, and it's no doubt controversial. Um, I wanted to see what you guys thought about um, people addressing that and trying to either take power away from it and conform, or conform to it, and how that's going to end up playing out in the future. Wonderful. Thank you. So, so to, to address the first question, um, I think what happened on 9-11 changed things for the following reasons. One, Al-Qaeda, which not a whole lot of people had focused on before, uh, finally got international attention, and we realized that this was an organization that was slightly different than other terrorist organizations. It was extremely well-funded by a private individual, not by a state sponsor. That made it harder to, to get at. Um, secondly, it was very well organized. It was very spread out, several thousand people. It seems to have had franchises as well, um, almost in a, a, a financial model. Um, and they also were willing to use suicide bombing suicide attacks that not all terrorist groups had used in the past. In fact, there was a long period of time when terrorists weren't doing that, and so the way you approach a suicide bomber or try to deter that is, is different than how you approach terrorists who want to survive. Um, it created huge challenges for the United States, and so I think that's what put, oh, plus 3,000 people died, which happens to be the same number that died the last time the United States was massively attacked on our homeland uh, soil, and I'm talking about Pearl Harbor. So you put all that together, and I think people really did feel that there was something way different about this situation than all the terrorist groups and terrorist attacks that had preceded it for the United States. And when that happens, people think about changing paradigms. And there was this big debate about whether you stay with the criminal law paradigm, you go to a military law paradigm, you have some kind of hybrid paradigm, and we're still having that debate today. But I do think that it's because 9-11 was so different that things did change, and, and the law changed with it. Well, speaking of uh, paradigms, a wonderful academic word, uh, the, uh, it seems to me that uh, where the hybrid we're in is both, is both a, a matter for, uh, inter for criminal law and uh, for the law of armed conflict. And uh, the government uh, has used uh, both uh, methods and needs to use both methods. Now, the other thing I want to uh, comment on uh, is uh, bin Laden, because uh, after all, we, uh, you know, speaking of uh, being involved in a difficult asymmetrical war, uh, we uh, finally find out uh, where uh, bin Laden is. Uh, we cannot uh, give any advance warning uh, to uh, Pakistan because uh, we believed uh, with some good reason that they were supporting him. It's, it's absolutely impossible to believe, at least for me, uh, that uh, the uh, Pakistan government built this mansion, this uh, heavily guarded place, and was unaware of it, you know, that, uh, that bin Laden was there. It's, it's, uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, the uh, question arises. Uh, some have claimed, of course, that he we should have gone in there and captured him, and the facts are somewhat unclear, or did he try to surrender? And if he tried to surrender, uh, it, uh, we shot him. Uh, this is a violation of human, human rights. Uh, there are press reports that indicate that uh, right from the get-go uh, that uh, they were going to go in there and they were going to kill him, and uh, whatever, and with good reason, quite frankly, uh, because uh, the uh, the I trying to try Bin Laden anywhere absolutely boggles the mind. For, besides all of the security issues, just to guard uh, the prison, what would happen, of course, is uh, that uh, Al-Qaeda would start taking Americans and other prisoners as hostages and execute or killing them uh, one by one unless we let him go. So I think it's clear to me uh, that they decided uh, to, uh, that he was going to be uh, killed uh, rather than uh, uh, taken. The question of uh, whether we violated uh, the sovereignty of Pakistan, my own view is, and so I write on this in uh, the article, no, <laughs> because uh, the evidence is, 
emphatically no, uh, because the evidence is that the Pakistanis were behind this, uh, that uh, the uh, and therefore uh, they were violating, to say the least, uh, international law and creating enormous uh, risk for the United States. And so, uh, to uh, the, the actions in uh, killing Bin Laden, in my view, were uh, were in accordance with international law. Any, any anything? Questions? Well, don't say <laughs> anything. Ask yourself a question and answer. Ah, uh, well, let's see. <laughs> um, well, for just one, one more vignette. I'm in a very the, sentimental frame of mind. Actually, a, yeah, a quickie. Oh, uh, just I, I got bombed in 1983 at the federal courthouse in New York, which was reputed to be an FALN bombing. That didn't change my mind about the general applicability of criminal law. Nobody got killed except a cop lost his fingers and his eyes. Um, and it, it made an impression on me, but it didn't change my view of criminal law. What changed my view of how you might have to apply law of armed conflict was what the intention was on September 11th. I always wondered why only 3,000 people were killed. That's because it was primary day in New York City, and people were going to work late because the, the built bombings were at 9.20 or thereabouts. So it could have been actually a an order of magnitude higher, and uh, that plus the... The, the, the fact that, and indeed, uh, I hate to credit him with any intelligence, but bin Laden was very imaginative, and nothing seemed to be beyond his ambition, was what I, made me think that we really did have to go into Afghanistan and, 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 and root him out. Um, uh, other matters did not develop so well, but I, I do think that paradigm shift is one that fundamentally changes the idea of sovereignty. Yeah, I, mean, I think I... Um, a little surprised, but I mean, it shouldn't be that there's so much consensus around. <laughs> uh, maybe we. Uh, uh, I mean, I think what what makes me think. I think that uh, there's a couple things. One, I think uh, we have to be. We're actually. We may have. I'm not predicting. We may have a change of administrations again at some point in the future. Maybe even sooner than some people would like. Um, and in other words, no, no politics here. <laughs> but in other words, this would be an opportunity to have another conversation about what the policies of a new administration would be. And what's interesting about that is I'm guessing that we've reached enough consensus in the United States among enough people that the policies are likely to remain, I'm guessing, the same, that there's been enough consensus that the reaction to 9-11 modifications and under the current have been roughly, there's enough consensus upon them that they're both legal and justified in some way, uh, with a lot of caveats, I think. Um, and I think that's a big uh, difference. So we, there's a legislative scheme in place that we've just never really uh, thought of before. So I think, I mean, the, the, the law has really changed in, in rather uh, dramatic ways. Um, and not all of them, I think, in good ways. So I'm kind of, I, but I, I do think that our political process has, uh, has reacted to the 9-11, to the and not always in good ways, but they've ultimately erected a legal infrastructure um, governing military commissions, governing uh, detention, um, governing review of detention, uh, and governing uh, perhaps um, maybe some aspects of the armed conflict so that we've been able to meld it into some sort of uh, relatively permanent legal structure so that we have not, I think one of the problems after 9-11 was the reaction was n no one was expecting that scale of attack and there was no policy response. And so they erected in the Department of Justice and other places sort of an ad hoc unilateral system that was not with enough political support. But I think we now have a situation where you can imagine if we had a new president, he would just basically say, well, I'm going to do basically what we've been doing in the past. And this would be, and so this is actually helpful because I think it's toned down some of the political contentiousness that surrounded a lot of these issues, but I think is a change. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good thing and something for us to think about um, uh, going forward. I wonder if that'll, that'll remain the same, but I think that's, that's something I've observed that that is a change for me in just the last few years. Maybe it's the fact that a, a new administration has arisen but has embraced many of the similar policies. That reflects, I think, bipartisan consensus on a lot of these issues that I would have had a hard time imagining maybe the first time I came to Case Western about five years ago to give a lecture on some of these issues on the war on terror. Um, and I feel like there was much more contentiousness at that point. We uh, have not uh, answered all the questions. We can't. But one thing that probably comes out very clearly with all this is that international law does adapt to changing circumstances. 
9-11 happened and huge challenges were there in order to address questions that were of urgency to society, urgency to the international community. And although we have muddled through many of them, and then there are questions that people are raising at the present time of relationship between human rights law and international humanitarian law in these changed circumstances. And the challenge that human rights law has faced because from Europe to Latin America at the United Nations, you can just see on sanctions and all kinds of issues that have emerged. Human rights uh, people have challenged time and again that international law and uh, the actions of states, even in the United Nations, that they are not complying with human rights norms. But uh, at the present time, this evolving, emerging kind of uh, norm and norms in many areas give us an indication that uh, Michael's question that initially he posed was a question and not the answer. International law is not in crisis. <laughs> What a nice way to end. Um, let, me, let me thank, first of all, the panelists and VED for organizing this. Um, also, all 30 of the panelists who've come from so far away uh, and some from right around the corner. You guys were so amazing today, and especially the people who came here and sat through this exciting dialogue. Those of you watching it on your computers back home, I really hope that you got something out of this. If you want to revisit it, in six months we will publish another version of our Journal of International Law with all of the articles from all of our speakers. And the final thing I want to do is thank the editors of the Journal of International Law who you've seen around here. They're the ones who are the infrastructure along with Nancy, Alice, and Jared that make this all possible. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.